Hello. I think um, if we're wondering how interested in real life in diversity and conclusion compared to HS2, this possibly answers the question, especially seeing as about a quarter of the audience are my employees, but thanks anyways. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm Emma Porter. I'm managing director at Story Plan. Um, I also am founder of a social enterprise that's focused on the circular economy in the construction sector, and I sit on Cumbria LEP. I'm really interested in economic development. Um, Story is predominantly a rail company, although we do do construction and geotechnical as well. Um, and as I said, I lead plant. Um, I did psychology university and then an MBA at INSEAD, so I'm really interested in what motivates people and why people do the things that they do. Um, and I've also wo always worked in male-dominated industries, including football, nuclear, civils, and most recently, rail. So when I first started my career, I really wasn't interested in kind of women's networks or women in business, or I just thought it was a completely even playing field, and I was just going to beat the boys fair and square. Um, but as I've moved my, through my career and kind of see less women at the table, and I uh, get more interested in what does the research show, and what does the data show, and what does it say in the literature, kind of realize that perhaps it's not quite as level a playing field as I first thought, and actually there are some barriers, and it's not just going to magically improve unless we begin to do some more about it. Um, so, right, next slide. So... I mean, the rail industry and the world in general is complex. And in a world where things change fast and where there's uncertainty and complexity, you need a diverse group of people that work well together. So a diverse team are almost always going to spot more opportunities, spot more problems, see risks differently, and have more ideas than a homogenous group of people. And the research shows this time and time again. So, you know, there's the McKinsey study showed that diverse teams are 35% more likely to have returns greater than the industry average. But there is a load, if you Google it, there are a load of studies that replicate this finding over and over. So things like 70% more likely to capture new markets, 2.3 times more cash flow per employee, 1.7 times more innovative, 120% more likely to hit financial goals. And it goes on and on. And this is pretty consistent across cultures and industries. So we know that diverse teams do lead to better decision-making processes, a wider range of perspectives, and a more creative and innovative team. But it's also true that diverse teams also have more potential to misunderstand, frustrate, disagree, and fall out, unless you have inclusion too. So just diversity by itself isn't enough to get the results. It's only when you have both diversity and inclusion that you really kind of start reaping the rewards. And in any team, certainly in my team, what I want is for people to bring their full selves to work, to be able to be themselves, not have to hide who they are, speak up if they have an idea, share whatever it is that they're worried about or thinking about, and to be able to share those opportunities and ideas easily and quickly. And EDI shouldn't be seen as an additional initiative on the to-do list or something that the HR team can do for you. Um, to me, it's the key to unlocking the potential in my teams and developing a high-performing team uh, that will deliver the best results. You know, I, I like to win. I'm competitive. This isn't an extra thing. This is the key to unlocking the best for everyone in my team. Um, and that is especially true if you're operating in a complex, fast-changing environment, which certainly we are and probably everybody in rail would say that they are. So... Before I share kind of a couple of insights into what sort of barriers the women in your organization might face, I do have a caveat, which is that I do not have all the answers. Um, these issues do affect men too. There's men who feel like they're interrupted in meetings. Um, not all women feel like these barriers have been in their way ever. Um, intersectionality makes it even more different. Diversity is obviously more than just gender. Um, and it is hard to get right. And often I'm frustrated by both the lack of progress and frustrated by the hypocrisy and kind of double standards that I can sometimes hear in my own advice, such as be confident versus be yourself. Or, you know, don't stand for that versus you've got to be a team player. Or don't do yourself down and apologize all the time when I'm still included in my talk on this, a little apology and a caveat and do myself down that maybe I don't know all the answers. Um, but the research does show a lot and I've been doing this for a little while now so there are some insights that I think are probably useful and that the research shows us that's helpful um oh sorry just this quote I love this quote this fight for the things you care about but doing it in a way that leads others to join you um that is kind of the way that I try and drive change and so with that in mind and I'm not just saying this because some of them are here I do like the men that I work with you know some men are great they work hard they care they're not kind of they're not doing some of these things on purpose. They're, um, they care about diversity. They're, they're, they're not trying to kind of cause a problem. And I think if you make anything around diversity divisive and women versus men, it's just really unhelpful and divisive and unproductive. And it also almost certainly is not going to convince our current team that diversity is a good idea. And diversity is not about kind of favoritism or one group versus another or saying one group is better than another. It's saying that a mixture of ideas will come up with more ideas than a group that are the same. 
which is good for everybody. Uh, so yeah. So one thing that is helpful though is I find it helpful to split the issues into three buckets. So the old-fashioned kind of explicit sexism, the um, unconscious bias of microaggressions. No, I've done that the wrong way around. Old-fashioned sexism, un microaggressions, and unconscious biases. Um, first bucket, this bucket, is the old-fashioned sexism from people who think that women just don't belong in construction. To be honest, I think it's pretty rare, and I have not come across that much in my career. And I think when you do come across it, although it might be annoying or upsetting, it's fairly easy to deal with because everyone around you will agree it's not acceptable and you can stamp it out. Um, and, and like I would strongly encourage if you do come across anything like that, that you do stamp it out. But the only issue is that because that doesn't happen very often and it happens less and less, it's easy to kind of mistakenly think that that's evidence that actually there's not a problem anymore and we've moved on and the world's fine and it's all just completely a level playing field um, and nothing more needs to be done. Um, but obviously I have two more buckets to talk about. So the second bucket is uh, microaggressions. These are the little kind of annoying things, the DSR on emails, the PP that doesn't quite fit, the images all being of men. And individually, they're not a big deal. They're really minor. And it feels a bit petty to be making a mountain out of a molehill. But the problem with this is this is a mountain made of molehills and that these constant low-level signals cumulatively send a message that you don't belong and you shouldn't be there. And so they discourage people from being able to speak up and to contribute fully. And so they are worth seeking out and getting rid of. So when I first worked in the construction division, which is a few years ago now, in every single, probably every meeting, every day, I was in meetings where people would say, right, right, gents, the lads on site, okay, men. Um, and it wasn't intentional, but I just constantly politely pointed out, you know, lads and ladies and girls. And, and for a period of time, it got much worse. <laughs> they, they would do it, but they would want a medal for saying, okay, right, gents and ladies, and want a prize for acknowledging I was in the room, and it was really awkward and not at all what I was trying to make happen. But over time, they kind of realized that actually it's just a habit and it was never an intentional trying to make me feel like I didn't belong. Because actually in that team, I was very welcome. I knew they wanted me there. I was made to feel welcome. It was just a habit, but it still made even me in my own family business in a team that wanted me there feel like I didn't quite fit in. And so they're worth getting rid of. Um, I think it's worth as well looking at sometimes these, these microaggressions can sit in policies. So the plant division... Um, Plant income story. Oh. <laughs> so it's okay. So um, story plant started out as prevent, providing plant to our internal jobs. So the people who worked in plant would tend to be there early in the morning to get the machines ready to go out to site. So there was a good reason that they were in first and in bright and early. But as plant grew and became a plant provider to external companies, it didn't really. We don't really need to all be in at seven o'clock anymore. But for a long time in plants. History, that remained as, that was our terms and conditions, starting time is 7 a.m. But if you've got small children to drop off at a nursery or a school, there's none open at 6.30 in the morning. So we'd inadvertently had a policy that was just excluding a whole group of people, but not adding actual any kind of value to the business. Um, it, it's not like that anymore, but it was there for way past the point that it actually served a, an operational purpose. So it's worth looking. Do you have things that are unintentionally sending a message that someone doesn't belong? Is it easy to get PP in different sizes? Do you have sanitary bins on site? Do your letter say, do you say, and I, I don't care if that's a legal thing. It's, it's pointless. Um, but the nice thing about this middle bucket is that no one is really too offended if you point out that you're not a Sarah and the gloves don't fit. And so it's, it's not too hard to fix. Like you can kind of just seek them out and spot them and fix them one by one and, and gradually get rid of those little low lying messages that tell people that this isn't that real is not for them. But of course that leads us to the third bucket. And this is the kind of big black fog of unconscious biases. So Murray Edwards College um, have a great piece of research worth a read called Collaborating with Men. And they looked at organizations where women were not progressing through um, in the way that you might expect. And they wanted to understand, well, what's happening in these organizations where that's not where that's the case? And um, they found kind of six key issues that, that women in those organizations were experiencing. The first was role congruence bias. This is men benefiting from the association between stereotypical views and leadership. So for example, imagine you're an engineer and you've got a difficult project that you want to get across to the team. And you walk into the room and you look like what that room were expecting an engineer to look like. So the first kind of, you can get straight to the task at hand. You can get straight to explaining whatever difficult concept you're trying to explain. But if you walk in that room and you're just not quite what the room was expecting, the first hurdle you need to get over is just to kind of convince them that you are an engineer and you do know what you're doing. And then you can get onto the task at hand. But you've got two little hurdles there instead of one. And that hurdle might be quite small. It might be as small as just the room be like, ha, huh, female engineer, okay, 
let's get on with the work. Or it might be much more of a, are you sure? Have you checked? Did you run that past someone else? And that actually, that hurdle can be quite big. And if that happens every time you're trying to get across a difficult concept, then cumulatively, that can have an, an impact on your career in the long term. The second one was ability bias. This was the finding that in these organizations, men were tending to be promoted based on potential, whereas the women were tending to be promoted based on experience. And obviously, you have potential a lot sooner than you have experience, and there's not really much you can do about that. And if you ask women, especially in male-dominated teams, which is probably all of the teams here, they will say that they often feel like they need to prove themselves, and they need to earn respect, and they need to prove that they know what they're doing before they're kind of accepted as the team. Um, and that is going to slow you down if you need to do that on every single project. And often on this one, I'll hear the argument that, um, well, yeah, but the team, it's got to be based on merit. And my argument to that is, is kind of a defense of not having a diverse, to diverse team. But my response to that is, of course it does. And if it was just about merit, then in these organizations, you would naturally see teams evolving. And if that's not happening, then you've got something else going on somewhere. And so I, I don't really buy the merit argument because it completely should be merit. But if it was just merit, we'd have a mix anyways. The third one is benevolent sexism. This is people making decisions on behalf of women that damage their career. Um, this was something that I actually saw happening in stories a couple of years ago. So we'd done quite well at recruitment and we had some really kind of high potential young women joining the team and the line managers maybe hadn't had women in their team before and they wanted it to go well and they were really trying to make sure it did go well. But as time went on, a few of them were coming to me, the young women were coming to me frustrated because they weren't making the progress that they expected to make and maybe the men who joined at the same time were. And, and this was not intentional, they couldn't figure out why. And they were getting really good feedback from their line managers, so they were kind of baffled, like, what am I doing wrong? And when I dug into that, there were two things that tended to be happening. One was that maybe the, the woman in question did have something that she needed to work on, that just no one was given a clear feedback on that needed to fix, because they were maybe trying to be nice or be soft or didn't want to upset her. And the second was that some of them weren't being given challenging enough projects, they were given the easier projects, because their line manager was kind of trying to protect them and give them an easy time and make sure they were okay. But that was not giving them the stretch that they needed to actually progress in their career. And so, you know, being inclusive does not mean wrapping women in cotton wool. Feedback and challenge and pushing yourself forward is an important part of development. And um, kind of giving people an, an easy ride is not necessarily what, what we're looking for. The fourth is performance evaluation bias. This is the perception of double standards. So for example, a loss of temper could be judged differently in a man than it is in a woman. In a man, studies have found that then they lose a temper, the room is more likely to say things like, don't cross him, he's really tough, he's mad today. Like, but he's still seen as being kind of strong and able to do his job and capable. Whereas when the women lose their temper, it's more likely to be seen as hormonal or weak or struggling or can't do the job and less able to do the job. And even the same behavior has different um, kind of perceptions. And there is a great study, which I've put some links to further uh, reading, um, called the Heidi Howard Rosen case, which, which showed exactly that happening. Uh, the fifth is language bias. This is people talking over or not hearing what the women in those organizations were saying. This can come through both in meetings and in one-to-ones. Um, I give this kind of a talk a lot and sometimes, like quite often there's nodding in the audience when I talk about this one. Um, it's, it's found in the research as well. It's not just imagined. It, it is a, a documented uh, phenomena. Um, Two good things to deal with that. For the meetings one, one is to make sure you've got really good chairs of meetings that bring everyone in so that everyone in the room has a voice and that everyone has a chance to speak. Uh, that can be just, it's a good business sense anyways to get the best ideas. In the one-to-ones, I think a fantastic question, particularly if you're a leader, if someone comes to you with a problem, um, is to ask, do you want me to listen? Do you want me to give advice? Or do you want me to act? And that goes a huge way towards actually understanding and listening to what that person's saying. Um, and then the final one was a networking bias. Now, this used to be things like decisions on the golf course. This is, men's, this is networks that are sidelining women. I personally didn't find that to be the case in my career, but it is something that comes up in the research. Um, but it's worth taking the time to notice if you are having team building events or if there are things where decisions are made, who's not there, who's somehow being excluded from that. If it's always drinks in the Friday night, are there parents of young children that can't make it? or if it's always alcohol related, are there people who don't drink who can't attend? Um, and flexible working is actually something that can exacerbate this. So flexible working policies can be great for removing some of the barriers to hiring a diverse team. And COVID, of course, made working from home much easier. But we need to be careful that this doesn't inadvertently mean some people are missing out on opportunities. And if flexible working is taken up disproportionately by women, which the 
research finds that it is, then we need to make sure that they still feel part of the team and they're not routinely missing out on conversations and decisions and opportunities that are happening in the office in the way that decisions do happen in offices. So this research, the Murray Edwards College, I am... Um, I first came across this a few years ago when I was working in, in the nuclear industry, and one of the things I found, I mean, the, the findings itself are interesting, but one of the things I found really fascinating was that the way it worked was a survey was sent out to all the employees in the team, uh, then there was a workshop with men, a workshop with women, and a workshop with everyone together. And in the women's workshop, they sat down and they put up the results and they put up the survey, and the women generally were like, yeah, sure, we know, but it's really hard what are we supposed to do about it. And then the workshop focused on, well, what kind of things might we do, such as good chairs of meeting being a good idea for everybody. But when we put up the results in the works men shop, the men generally were like, no way. Like, that can't be right. I do not see that at all. Like, I can't believe that that is what the surveys are finding. Because that's not my experience of working here. And like, I don't think the women are not listened to in meetings. Like, you're listened to in a meeting. And the, really, their whole workshop was spent questioning the validity of the data. And it wasn't because they were trying to undermine the workshop or like undermine the, what was, they were talking about. It was just that from where they were standing, that was complete news to them. Like, they had not seen that happening. They weren't trying to derail it. They just were, no way. And, and it really kind of taught me that probably before that, I might have been a bit less patient with someone that if I saw something that I thought was unfair. But it really made me realize, like, it's not intentional. People can't see the things they can't see. I advocate for diverse teams. One of the strengths of that is people see this from different perspectives. And that is true for when we're talking about diversity and inclusion. People cannot see the things that they can't see, and it's worth just taking time to kind of understand things from where other people are, uh, are standing. Um, and so for this one, a good starting point is this one's not got as easy a, a solution as the kind of bucket one, stamp it out, bucket two, just find them and get rid of them, they're easy. Um, really, this starts with things like just learning more about it. And um, the Matthew Syed podcast on diversity, which is one I've got a link to, is an excellent kind of start to why do diverse teams do better. Um, you know, pay attention and ask people in your team, do they feel like they're heard? They, are there people who are consist consistently there and there are people who are consistently not there? And why are they not there? You want to discourage interrupting and talking over each other and take on board a much wider range of views when you're making decisions and ask for feedback more. And as a leader, send a signal that you are approachable and available and you want to listen to what people have to say. Not, that means not rushing from one meeting to the next glued to your phone. And make space for people to share their ideas and problems with you. Um, the Promises of Giants is an excellent book as well that I read before Christmas that I've been recommending to everybody ever since. And I think that's excellent as well for thinking about how do leaders convey that they are interested in listening. We also often talk about women needing to be more confident, to speak up, to shake off imposter syndrome. And they are things that I find myself fairly regularly talking to, to the, some of the women that I mentor. And the conversation will go along the lines of, you know, I'm struggling to get my point across. Maybe I need to be better prepared. But actually, when you dig into it in the meetings, maybe she's saying things like, maybe I'm wrong and I'm sorry if I misunderstood, but I think maybe the answer might be this. And when you phrase what you think that way, you can forgive. No, I don't mean you, Chloe, <laughs> but you do do that. Uh, <laughs> um, like you can forgive them that somebody hears that and thinks, well, maybe she doesn't know the answer and maybe she's not sure. But actually, you do know the answer. It's a politeness thing. So I think that those things have their place. But, but for me, I would like to go kind of beyond just having to tell women to be more confident and to lean in and speak up. And actually, the aim should be to get leaders where, and in, to that create an environment where everyone is able to contribute without having to work so hard and without having to work so hard at speaking up. And um, so, yeah. So that's, that's kind of my main uh, thing. So the final kind of, just to sum up the, the three buckets and what to do about them. Bucket one, just don't stand for it. Easy, stamp it out. Uh, second, start seeking out those microaggressions. And you need to get others to do the same because they'll see ones that you just don't see as being a problem. Like the seven o'clock start time sounded perfect for plant. There was a good reason. But actually, when you think about it, it's a barrier. Um, yeah, easy to fix. And they're hurting your business. Uh, and the third one is that, you know, listen, take time to learn more about this, notice who doesn't, who doesn't get heard, be open to some of the things that you find feeling a bit uncomfortable, and be open to kind of really spotting this and seeing it happening, asking people when is it happening. So yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. That was really interesting and insightful. Um, and I think you know, really resonated with a lot of people in the room. I saw a lot of nodding as well, which is always really nice to see. Not just the people that work for me. Though. Not just the people that work for me, <laughs> people were nodding. Um, for those of you who might not know me, I'm Daisy Chapman-Chamberlain. I am Innovation Manager at East West Rail, uh, which is a rail project for anyone who doesn't know. 
between Oxford and Cambridge connected communities. But let's kick off with our panel today. Let's go down the line and just do a quick couple of introductions for the people who've just joined us. Oh, actually, I've got... You're mic'd up. I'm mic'd up, <laughs> Magic. sorry. <laughs> Britney Spears mic. Britney Spears mic, exactly. I'm Devyani Gupta. I'm a consultant. I'm a director in PwC. Um, and I'm here because I'm really passionate about the diversity inclusion um, agenda. But particularly as a woman of colour, I've worked in transport for many, many years. And I still don't see that many people of colour around this room. I'm probably, in fact, I am the only one. Um, and I want to change that. So um, delighted to be here. Hey, hi, I'm Laura Tyree, the head of People for McCulloch Group, um, and I'm here today basically to, to help and support any kind of women that, that are looking to specifically get into the rail industry. I think it's, a, it's a, a definitely a, 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 an industry where there isn't a lot of women at all, really, um, and they, they do struggle to, to kind of move up the ladder. So, um, yeah, it's just to, to, to support that, really. Amazing. So I think what I'd like to start with by asking, and I'll be very frank, is do we need to be more drastic internally? Because I started working in transport about eight years ago, and eight years ago we were having these conversations and these presentations, and they're incredibly valuable, and obviously it resonated with a lot of people in the, I say the room, the tent, but we're still having the same conversations. And in fact, since gender pay gap mandatory reporting began six years ago in transport specifically, our pay gap has got worse between men and women. So in 2017, the gender pay gap in transport in the UK was 9.6%, and last year it was 10.4%. So we're going backwards as an industry. Do we need to be more drastic? Is there more that we should be doing? Do we need to be more serious about this, frankly? Because everyone in this room is already on board. What about the people who aren't on board? Um, would anyone like to start first? Happy to. I think, I think drastic is one thing, but forcing people you, is not going to get there. Um, it, it's around these sorts of conversations that we're having today. Um, the fact that we started off with not many people, but so many people have actually come, I think that's hugely, hugely important. I think that, that does matter. And I think it, the intent in organisations matter. Um, capturing the data, to your point, really, really is important because that's what keeps us honest. That's what keeps us accountable. Um, creating psychologically safe places in the same way that health and safety as, a, as an industry, we've been so, so good about that in our track record. Creating psychologically safe places where people can speak up and mm. should speak up. Um, that I can say that, I, that something is not okay, that others watching can say that what, what's happening to you isn't okay, is important. And seeing people like me, like all of us at the top table is important because I want my son to be able to look up and go, that's my mum up there at the top table in PwC. I personally feel really, really proud of our business and what we're doing, and I'm sure you are clearly from Story Plant, which is brilliant, but I don't see that many people being actually serious as making mm. this is a business priority, not a DNI strategy that sits over there, but fundamentally part and parcel of every yeah. single thing that we do. I think that's, that has to be the way forward, right? It's, it's weird, though, isn't it? Because it, it is, it's a competitive edge. Like, yeah, every bit of absolutely. research shows mm -hmm. you've got to make more money. And, like, well, absolutely. It, I, I don't think, just, like, I actually, think don't is, tell the others. Shh. This, is one of the, <laughs> this is one of the sticking points, is that we know the data's there mm. for in terms of commercial success. And sometimes it feels like it's not believed. Yeah. Sometimes it feels like, oh, that can't be true. It is true. Yeah. I, think, I think the fact that we're actually here discussing it, but the fact that we have to be potentially drastic, you know, it's 2023, we shouldn't be have to, having to have, it should be, it should just be that it's unconsciously, as part of a, an organisation, you have the right people in the right roles, and it doesn't matter if they're male or female or, or you know, it should just be that they, but whatever impact, whatever experience, whatever, whatever, um, you know, education that they bring to it, it's that, that should be the key. It shouldn't be that you consciously have to think about it. And for me, that's, as I say, it's 2023. You shouldn't have to do that. It should just be part of your everyday beliefs as an organisation and, and that that's just what you do. So yeah. I think that, that for me is, is really disappointing that mm. that's not the case in a lot of organisations and a lot of industries. I think there's certain industries out there that, that are very good at it and they, they, they do do it and it's... It is, it is just part of their, their daily living, you know. Um, but to be in, in organisations where potentially that isn't the case for me is, is a disappointing thing. And we shouldn't have to. You shouldn't have to fight harder. You shouldn't have to, to speak up louder. It yeah. should just be your experience and, and who you are as a person 
is what brings, you know, it shouldn't just be that it's it's part of what you have to think about, you, sh you know. It should be inherent. Think, yeah, yeah, it should ultimately yeah. become just business as usual. Exactly. I think there are which is what we're working as towards. well in rail. Like I came from civils into rail and I was expecting rail to be way like more forward thinking and way ahead of where like the civils were. And I couldn't believe that we've got sites that don't have welfare, like not just women's welfare, any welfare, yeah. all the time. Like, most weeks we'll have at least one job for Network Rail that doesn't have a toilet, which I just think is absolutely ridiculous. How is that even legal? Like, what, what year are we in that that's okay? But it is, it happens all the time. It happens all like, the time. Like, I've been trying to dance in the audience, does been uh, tasked with saying, I don't want to send any of our people to any site that doesn't have toilets. Which is... Like, I don't, even if the client won't pay for it, we're sending a damn toilet. We can send an RRV and a MUP and the crane control and the posts and the transport, we can't manage to send a toilet. Come on. It's so a very, are, it's a very basic it. standard <laughs> to uphold. <laughs> so I think, yeah, definitely right to uphold it. And I think an example, again, of actually we're fighting for, you know, gender parity and gender equality actually benefits everyone. Even it's just for not, everyone, there should yeah. be well, there should it's be a basic toilet. humanity, just a, just isn't a toilet. it? It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's basic needs. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah, basic human needs, exactly. Um, I'd like to also just touch on the role of kind of early education and engagement in this piece as well. So from my personal perspective, and I've run a lot of programs engaging young people in rail, what kind of role does that early engagement have to play? How important is that in terms of the, the way we shape, in terms of the future gender makeup of our workforce? Well, it's massive, isn't it? There's the, is it called the Scully effect that shows that kind of teenage girls that grew up watching the X-Files were more likely to go into a career in STEM. Yeah. Like, you can actually measure the impact mm -hmm. that Scully, as a role model of a scientist, had. So, it, I mean, the, that's well documented that it does matter. Like, you've got to be able to see, you know, you can't be what you can't see. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I think I agree, but attraction only goes so far. And having lots of school visits, lots of those sorts of uh, initiatives are great for giving a spotlight to our industry. But unless it's part and parcel of everyday conversations, making our industry attractive for everybody constantly, the small conversations we have day to day with our children, with, um, with our, uh, our friends' children, talking about how exciting, how amazing this industry is and why they should want to be a part of it and how many options they have to be a part of it, that matters just as much because those yeah. are the interactions they have on a regular basis, not the school visits. Yeah. They're just not. So I think that matters and I think Attraction is great, but we're still not seeing our women or people of colour getting to the top. Why mm. is that? It's because we're not doing enough to make it a, a good enough place to stay and showing that it can be a place where you can progress. The very fact that this panel is made up of only women mm. is not ideal, really, is it? No. We should have a much more diverse makeup of our people, people from the audience, who all of you have such a huge part to play in, in making this a genuinely diverse and inclusive um, uh, industry, as you were saying. So, um, so yeah, attraction, yes, but making it consistent mm. across every, every conversation we have, whether it's on the TV, whether it's on, on radio, on whatever it might be. Yeah, absolutely. I think women in, in any industry tend to go into traditional female roles, so human resources, finance, yeah. um, potentially some sales and business development, but I think, and when you look at executive leadership teams or board of directors, it tends to be any women on the board tend to be in those specific kind of gender suited roles, if you like, and I think it, you're 100% correct, it needs to be about, it's not, it's not just kind of teaching, it's not just about going out and doing interactions with Early, early education or, or even college education or university education, it's actually about l look at what people can do, you know, look, look, look what we as a business do and, and supporting people to get into those kind of top level roles, no yeah. matter, as I say, what gender you are, it, it should just be natural yeah. and Absolutely. basic. Absolutely. Um, we could talk about this all day, we could have an entire conference on this topic, and we do, many times. Yeah. Um, we are just about out of time, though, so what I would love is if each of you could give us maybe your kind of 20-second main takeaway. What would you mm. want the audience most to take away from today? And if we want to start at the end. Oh, God. I know, I know. <laughs> really on the spot here. Um, I, think, I think to go out and look at the... Learn more about it. There's a load of really good stuff out there. Read, yeah. read more. If I want to pick one, Promises of Giants would be my uh, top one. Totally brilliant. It's really good. Thanks, Liz. <laughs> I think be open-minded and, 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 as I say, don't have stereotypical roles in your mind. It's, it's using who you believe is the right person, not just what you think fits into a box. Yeah, challenge yourself. I think sponsorship matters. 
Um, it really matters, and passion for your industry matters. The more people see how brilliant this industry is to work with and for, the more people will naturally be attracted to it. Yeah. Um, whether it's from a white male, whether it's from a woman of colour, whether it's from... It, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's just, just really, really matters. Absolutely. Well, wonderful. That is the end of our seminar sessions for today. Thank you so much for coming. If we could have a round of applause, please, for our panellists.